So tonight we welcome back Oakland University Professor Frank Cardamon for another historical lecture. This evening he'll be discussing one of the most important events of World War II, D-Day, when the Allied when the Allies for when the Allied forces invaded Normandy and began the liberation of German-occupied France from Nazi control. Frank will discuss the genius around the planning of the largest um, invasion in history, along with the stories of the brave men who helped lead it to lead to its success. Please give Frank a warm RHPL welcome. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm really. Uh, Delighted to be here. In fact, I'm humbled to be here. Yeah, this event was one of the most significant events in World War II. And to be able to share it with all of you as a remembrance is very special to me. I am not an event. I have not been in the military. But since I was 22, I have been studying World War II actions, the leaders and the battles. So I come to you with a lot of background, and in particular, this, this event of D-Day is one of the most important ones that I have studied over the years. Before I begin, I would like to know in this audience, do we have any World War II veterans? Do you want to stand, please? Please stand. Turn around and look. Thank you both. Are there other veterans in this room from other wars? Uh, yes, please stand if you've been a veteran. And let's give them a welcome too, please. Please stand. Tonight's program is about remembering. Tonight's program is about those who sacrificed for all of us, who changed the course of the war, who then went on to destroy the Nazis and change the world for what could have been something else. So tonight, we're going to talk about D-Day. So I don't get mixed up with my machine here. What does the D in D-Day stand for? Does anybody know? No? Yes. It really is, but, but there is a term, it's a decision day, or dead drop day. And this decision day was very monumental. It was so monumental that it shifted the axis of what was happening. So why was it important? It was important because the people of Europe, for four years plus, were under the guise of the Nazis. Can you imagine living in Normandy for four plus years with Nazis in your house and around you, and dictating everything you did 24-7. And that happened, for 20, that happened for four years. The idea was to liberate them and to move on to Germany. The other part was to create a second military front because on the eastern side, the Russians were beginning to make some headway against the Nazis. But you've got to understand, it was a bloody battle over in Russia and they needed a second front. The idea was to bring an integrated force called the Allied Supreme Force. And they put that under General Eisenhower. And the last thing, it was to become a beachhead for that movement of the military to liberate France and then all of Europe. The belief was that if they were successful in the landing, that the war would be over in the winter of 1944. It took six more months because nobody had anticipated the Battle of the Bulge, which really delayed a lot of the action before they could succeed. The journey I'm gonna take you on tonight is the following. I'm gonna talk to you about the conditions leading up to the invasion. I'm gonna talk to you about the military leaders and their philosophies 
so you can understand what was taking place at the time of D-Day. I'm also going to talk about the Allied strategies and the spies and deceptions and the code breaking that most people don't know about that was so instrumental in the success of D-Day. And then I want to talk about the invasion itself, followed by heroes, and then followed by remembrances and tributes so that we don't forget which was a message that was left by a lady that you'll hear from later on because she made it clear that so we don't forget these people who laid their lives to protect all of us. So that's our program for tonight. So let me get started. Here are the conditions leading up to the invasion. If you look at this, if I can make sure I hit the right buttons here. If you look at this, everything in brown is Nazi controlled, everything. It's either directly in control or it's uh, controlled through a lot of the uh, uh, agencies that they had, yeah. The white is Switzerland, Spain, Ireland, and Sweden tried to be independent in this event. But if you look, England is the only country that's left. And if it wasn't for Churchill, as I explained last year, we may still be talking German today. But the fact is, this was the environment on June 5, when the Allies needed to launch their invasion from Great Britain into Normandy, which is right there. On June 5, what most people don't remember is that there already was a second front. The second front was down here, got these buttons, in Rome. On June 5 in Rome, the third army, excuse me, seventh army, seventh army paraded through the streets of Rome. They had come up through Sicily, Salerno. They marched up through the, the battles over Monte Cassino. They finally emerged and got to Rome. And on the 5th of June, they're marching in Rome. My uncle was in World War II. On June 6, 1944, he was at the seaport town of Civita Vecchia, which is Rome's seaport town. And he sent a postcard to his brother saying, we just marched in Rome and we just took over a German battalion there and he had taken the, the, the lieutenant's equipment and so forth and he just wanted to know how his brother was. But we have the postcard of June 6th where he was. So on June 5, we have an invasion force in southern Europe in Rome. Question is, what were the Allies going to face when they came into Europe? Now, they knew already they were coming into Normandy, okay? But what were they going to face? If you look at this green line here, that was called the Atlantic Wall that created a possibility of where the Allies would land. And Hitler wanted to make sure that that wall was protected and it was impregnable. He made it very clear that he wanted protection along that wall so that any invasion that was coming in would be stopped at the waterline. And he put in charge one of his best generals, Rommel, the Desert Fox. And we'll talk about him a little bit. By the way, this line is about 1,000 miles. The key concerns for the Germans was where and when. Two important things, because if they could create a defense where the Allies were coming in, they had the manpower, they had the military might to push them back into the, into the water. The closest point of this is right here. That's Calais. That's Dover, 28 miles. And that was the idea of trying to convince the Germans that Calais was going to be the entry point for the invasion. Okay, so some of the military leaders, the Nazi leaders. We had the first one, von Rundstedt. He was a commander in chief, and his headquarters was in La Roche Guillon in France, which is just outside of Paris, okay? And you had Rommel, who was subordinate to him, and who was the desert fox, as I mentioned, and he was the designer of the Atlantic Wall. 
And one of the places that he really did a banged up job was on Omaha Beach. And we'll get to that a little bit later, okay? But on December, uh, December, on January 5, 1944, the weather conditions on June 3, 4, and 5 were so stormy that waves were 20 feet high. The Germans said, no way in hell will there be an invasion. And as a result of that, Rommel heads out of the Normandy area, heads back home, stops in Paris, buys a pair of shoes for his wife, and gives it to her on her birthday, June 6, 1944. So he wasn't even on the beach or near the beach when D-Day occurred. In fact, most of the Nazi generals were not near the beach. Many of them were at some uh, educational programs. Romulo was gone. Von Rundstedt was at some other function. So they were not being led. And as a military might in Germany, you're led by the top, not the bottom up, the top down. And the big leaders were not available to the Germans. Then the most important thing was Adolf Hitler, back in Berchtesgaden, Germany, had the final authority for the most important group of military might of the Germans, and that was the 15 Panzer Group, which was up near Calais. The German Panzers were the best machines available in the war. They had a, th a greater thickness, they had a greater distance to kill, and they were dominant. Had the 15th Panzer Division moved down into Normandy within the first 24 hours, the invasion may not have been successful. Here was a conflict in strategy, particularly between von Rundstedt and Rommel. Von Rundstedt, except for Calais, he wanted to keep his military back about 100 miles or so this way, okay? And then when they found out exactly where the invasion was going to be, he wanted to move all of them to the invasion site. Rommel, on the other hand, said, oh no, I want all the military might right up on the beaches. I don't want them getting off the boats. I want to stop them right in the water. In fact, <clears throat> I want to make that day so bad, it will be the longest day in their life. And of course, that was the title of uh, Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest Day. <clears throat> His position was, if the military is held in the rear, the enemy air force will annihilate the German soldiers, tanks, and equipment before they can get to the beaches. And you know something? That's exactly what happened. Because the Luftwaffe had planes, not as many as the Allies at that point, but they didn't have any pilots. All the good pilots were gone. They only had kids, and they didn't know how to fly properly. So they couldn't even get up in the air. And then the final authority on the movement of the Panzers. It took four hours before they told Hitler that Normandy was invaded. Why? He was sleeping. And they didn't want to bother him. And because he had final authority, the 15th Panzers were waiting for direction. And they got nothing. So his strategy and the way in which he managed from central authority impacted this invasion. The American allies. Of course, we had Eisenhower as the supreme commander of all of them. And what a job he did, because he had to keep in line Americans, Canadians, Brits, Polish, French, and all the other ones. And you know something? Each one of those groups of people have a different way of fighting wars. And they have a different way of living. And so for him to be able to keep these people together into one unified force was probably his greatest success in the war. You had Montgomery who was in charge of all allied ground forces going into Normandy. And you had Bradley who was in charge of the two American beaches, the Utah and Omaha beaches. And then we had General Patton. Now, one of the greatest moves I feel that Eisenhower made was to protect Patton from his own problems and 
to use him as a deception. You see, a few, I, let's see, there's 44, about two years earlier, uh, about a year and a half earlier, when they inv invaded Sicily, he took it on himself to challenge Montgomery to get to Messina first, and he won. But in doing so, he had lost a lot of military soldiers. And he would go into the, what would I call it, the hospital, field hospital, and he would see those soldiers. And he, he, he was emotional with those soldiers. I mean, he just loved his soldiers, and particularly those who were, who were harmed and injured, and it was always bad. But there was this one guy who was shell-shocked, and he just stood there shaking. And Patton said to him, in no uncertain terms, you're going back to the front because you're a chicken son of a bitch. And then he pulled his gun. He was ready to shoot the bastard. Excuse me. He was ready to shoot the guy. Okay? He was ready to shoot him. And, and of course, the military and the, the doctors all pulled him aside. Well, he did it twice. It got back to Marshall in D.C., Marshall being the chief and reporting to the president. And, and Eisenhower said, what am I going to do with this guy? The... the, the the news media in the United States was so overwhelming, they wanted Patton out of there. They wanted him strung up for what he did to those young kids. Patton, didn't know, and Patton had no knowledge about shell shock and, and issues of war like that at that time. And so <clears throat> Eisenhower tells Marshall, um, I don't know what to do with him. What do you think? And Marshall says, I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> so Eisenhower uses him as a decoy. He sends them all over the Mediterranean, and of course the Germans are following. Why? The Germans feared Patton greater than any military leader that the Allies had. There was no question that if anybody was going to lead the invasion of Europe, it had to be that guy. And all along, Eisenhower's using him as a dupe. I mean, he's, he's, he has him as a, he has him heading up a ghost army, the first U.S. Army group, made up of 100,000 nothing, made up of 50,000 tanks that were nothing, made up of all these boats and ships and all these things. The only person in Fusog was Patton, but they deceived the Germans. We'll talk about that. One of the most important parts of D-Day was this whole idea of what's the strategy, what were the spies doing, what's the deception plan, and what did the code breaking tell us about what was happening on the beaches on June 5 uh, before the D-Day? So the overall strategy is very simple. We're going to move the people from Great Britain to France. And the objective is going to be Normandy, and the name of that particular battle confrontation will be called Overlord. And we're going to do it with a lot of intelligence and deception and all types of ways in which we try to confuse the Germans about what's going on here. The lodgement, we're going to be at beaches, and then we're going to build an ocean bridge. The Mulberry Bridge was a bridge that was made up in pieces like a jigsaw puzzle in Great Britain. It was taken to Normandy, and it was hooked up to bring in from a mile or two out in the ocean, the deep waters, all of the tanks, all of the trucks, all of the ammunition, all of that stuff had to get on shore because Normandy is not a deep sea port. So they had to do it from outside. So they made two of them. One of them didn't make it. There was a storm in a few days after D-Day and it destroyed it, so they only were able to use one at uh, Aramanche. The approach England to Normandy, the breakout would be with Patton, although he didn't even know it until July. D-Day strategy. Induce the enemy to expand or expend available effort on fortifications in other areas and then the target area. In other words, keep them away from Normandy. And the second piece was retain forces in areas as far removed as possible from target area before and after the Neptune assault on Normandy. <clears throat> Deception worked with the Germans before. It worked in the Battle of El Alamein, and it worked in the Battle of the Sicily Invasion, where they put up a, a man who had been dead for about 
three or four weeks, dropped them in the water, gave them a lot of false information, and tried to convince the Germans that the invasion would be in Sardinia rather than Sicily, and the Germans bit. We know that even after the war with the research that were found in German uh, documents that they really bit on that. So they were, they were, they were receptive to a feint. They were receptive to a change of uh, deception. Churchill said, in wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. In other words, we gotta lie the hell out of them and we want them to believe some of it because we need to know where we're going and we wanna try and deceive them. So there are three action plans or three events. One is called Fortitude, which is the deception plan. The other was Ultra, the code breaking at Bletchley that I talked about about a year and a half ago. And then lastly was Overlord, the invasion. <clears throat> guess, who, guess who directed the Double Cross Committee? It was Churchill himself. He had a hand in almost everything. But the whole operation for deception was called Bodyguard, and the deception plan was to lead the Germans to believe that the invasion would be in Calais and not in Normandy. And three, I have four up there, but the first three of the four to two deception plans, the fourth one is the ultra secret right here, which was part of that whole, whole deception. Um, let's see, Calais would have been one. Uh, I would say, I would say about 500 miles, maybe a little less, maybe a little less. So the deception plans under Fortitude, Fortitude North. Well, here was, the, here was the total Fortitude plan that they were trying to throw out at Germany. They were trying to convince the Germans that it might be in, it might be in uh, Norway, it might be in Sweden, it might be in uh, Calais, it might be down in the Bordeaux region, it might be in Spain, it might be down at the uh, Gibraltar, it might be in France, it might be in Italy. They were trying to throw everything out to convince the Germans that it wasn't gonna be Normandy. But the three most important ones, whoops, sorry. Sorry about that. The three most important ones was Fortitude North. They were gonna move troops from Scotland into, into uh, Norway. And Fortitude South, moving them to Calais. And then in Lisbon, they had a, uh, uh, they had a, a double agent who was convincing the Germans that uh, the invasion would be in Calais. So <clears throat> what you have to understand is the Brits had been at war for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they had a deception mindset that was always to try and fake the enemy. And what they did is after the second week that war began, it is believed by the people I've read and talked to, that every British, excuse me, every Nazi agent in Britain was captured and either thrown in prison or forced to work as a double agent. So, for almost four years, for almost, four, sorry, for almost four years, this guy was a double agent. This guy for a few years, this guy for almost four years. So these are three. There were like 20, 30 of these kinds of people that were trying to play a role in convincing Germany was not going to be, or uh, 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 convincing them that Calais was going to be the, the place of invasion. So here's the first guy, Brutus, Polish guy. <clears throat> he was in prison in 41, became a German agent, and then uh, the British got a hold of him and made him uh, change his mind. And he was very influential in trying to convince the chief operations, the command that, in fact, the invasion was going to be in, um, in Norway. So he had a major, major influence on convincing the Germans that it was gonna be uh, Norway. But here is the guy that if you really wanna read something incredible, read the story of Garbo. Read the score, uh, story of one Pujol, who may by himself have created a success for the D-Day invasion, and here's why. 
In the early morning of June 6, 1944, Garbo sends a message to his counterpart in Germany and says, there is an invasion going on in Normandy right now. Be aware of it and, and come protect yourself. But more importantly, this was before it happened. More importantly, this is a deception. This is not the real invasion. The real invasion is going to be Calais. And they bought it because they trusted this guy who had been there, what he thought was their agent, for almost four years. On May 1941, July 1541, he sent his first letter to Germany. You see this up, whoops, excuse me. You see this operation up here? Every one of those people is fictitious. There is nothing about any of them that is true. This is what he made up for four years to convince the Germans that he had this inside uh, knowledge about what the governments were doing. And um, he convinced them that he did because the Brits were so smart, they give them information that was real and it would happen. And the Germans say, yeah, see, he knows what's going on. Well, there's something right here that was interesting. <laughs> Sorry, guys. What is going on here? He had one of his guys killed in 1943. The next day in the London Times was that guy's obituary, who never existed. But he made, them, he made the Germans convinced, in fact, that guy died. They had an enormous amount of deception with this one guy that after the, the battle in June, July, August, he reports back to Germany, and he says to his counterparts there, look, I'm getting watched very closely now. I may have to shut down operations. And they said, okay, terrific. So they awarded him Germany's highest honor and gave him the Iron Cross. Pretty amazing, eh? Pretty amazing. They gave him the Iron Cross. His name on the German side was Arabal, A-R-A-B-A-L. And with the Allies, of course, it was named Garbo. He created his own death while he was 51 or so, and he went to live in uh, South America, and then he, he resurrected himself and came back. And he was just a very interesting character who played a very important role in, in D-Day. Now, here's 42 South. <clears throat> this is Patton's ghost army. They had even designed a logo that they made sure the Germans knew about. Okay, they, they had these uh, inflatable tanks, uh, balsam wood and, 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 and plastic um, covers. And more importantly, they convinced the Germans that he had over 100,000 army waiting in deployment to Pas de Calais. That was the flag that they used and they had, had it all over the place. These are boats on the, on the water there were balsam wood and plastic. And every night, they would have people come in and turn them around and move them so that it would look different. And they would allow the Germans to fly over and take pictures of it to demonstrate. And then they had the intelligence on the uh, radio waves going 24-7, like there was a lot of people calling and talking and so forth, like there was a US Army group. Even the plane, plane was out of balsam wood. The last person in this group was a guy named uh, Dusko Popov. And he was Agent Tricycle, and he was a playboy. In fact, in the whole story of, uh, of Dusko, uh, he was the inspiration for James Bond 007 uh, with Ian. Um, but he was a playboy, but he had a lot of, you see, Lisbon and Portugal and Spain were hotbeds for uh, spies. They were independent, but boy, there were a lot of spies there. And they would talk with one another. They all knew who they were, but they would, they would learn about what was happening. And he was very influential as a German playboy. And he mentioned, and he would continue to talk to the Germans about Pas de Calais, Pas de Calais, that's where it's coming. And people began, the Germans began to believe him. Now, a little side note on this guy is that about three years before, about June, July of 1941, he told the FBI of the United States that he had information that in a few months, 
there was going to be a bombing at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. And they didn't listen to him. Can you believe that? Yeah, he was the guy that did that. Okay, so what was bodyguard results? Convinced the high command, Fusag existed, Normandy was a diversion, resulting in the Germans' 15th Army and tanks and uh, held to Calais until August of 44. That was a couple months before they even moved, thinking that Calais still was going to be the invasion site. Um, and something I've shared before here is that on June 9, three days after D-Day, the Allies knew that the 15th Army Reserves were not going to be released. And so how did they know that? Bletchley Park, the ultra-secret, where we've all learned recently the success of what Alan Turing and the people uh, who worked there uh, were able to achieve. Bletchley Park is about 90 miles due north of London. And during the war, they built two railroad spurs, one from Ox Oxford and one from Cambridge. And what they did is they had all of the experts, the crossword puzzle experts, the translators, the uh, various people who had a mindset towards breaking codes come in every day. And at the peak of this... Uh, Location, the peak of the war, right about 1944, there were 12,000 workers at this site that worked every day to break the code and provide information back to the leaders in the field. And on June 6, it is believed and it was reported that the German field commanders could get their military orders faster if they contacted Bletchley first. <laughs> True story. Amazing story. And here was the guy who was responsible, a guy that was a genius, a genius in mathematics that even today they're using a lot of his basic uh, mathematical models on artificial intelligence to uh, create uh, uh, the new supercomputers. He designed the first computer known to man. And if any of you are familiar with uh, IBM's Watson Project, at the basis of IBM Watson Project is his theories on artificial intelligence. Anyhow, this gentleman never realized the success he had. He died in the 50s. He committed suicide. He was a homosexual, and at that point in time in life in London, you had two choices, chemical castration or prison. And he took the chemical castration because he didn't want to leave his equipment and keep building on the success of his equipment. And for some reason, at some point, and they're not sure what or how, he committed suicide. And uh, the ultra secret was exposed in 74, and the, uh, the queen gave him a royal pardon in 2013. Uh, anybody see the movie, Imitation Game? If you haven't, you ought to if, if you have an interest in this, this topic, because it is one of the more remarkable movies. Historically, some of the things aren't accurate, but the overall impact of what happened and how it happened is very accurate. And the line that is so important in the movie is sometimes it is the people no one imagines anything of who do the things no one can imagine. And that was the genius in the mind of Alan Turing. So, so June 9 messages were decoded in Normandy. They were presented to Churchill, Eisenhower, Sir Alan Brooke, and only a few others. And the message from Ultra was, Hitler's convinced Normandy is just a diversion. Pas de, Calais, Pas de Calais is the real invasion site. 15th Army is not on the move from Calais. So if you're, if you're trying to invade somebody and you know three days later that your enemy is not going to move, you have some advantages, okay? By the way, on June 6, this was a picture of the beaches of Calais. And it was heavily fortified behind it by the 15th uh, uh, Panzer Division that would have been uh, very, very difficult to manage. You see, just a digression. Two years before that, there was an invasion of Europe at the little town of Dieppe, which was just north of Calais. And in Dieppe, the Canadian forces went in hoping to get a foothold, and they were destroyed. Uh, it was a total annihilation. 
both it wasn't very well planned. Second, the sand was so soft that the equipment couldn't move. It was just a total disaster. So there was some concern about what was going to happen at Calais, and could they get across that 20 mile, 28 mile stretch and be able to land the kind of invasion force that they wanted. And when they decided Normandy was a place, they felt a lot better about that. We can see here very quickly that the Allies didn't have as many German forces that were available to them. The key thing here is 31 aircraft available on D-Day for Germans, but there were no pilots. So the air cover of Normandy from be before, days before, the night of, the day of, and the days after that were controlled by the Allies. They just didn't have the pilots anymore to be able to sustain it. So we give a thank you to Adolf Hitler for that. So the invasion, D-Day. There's a picture, which I think is a very good picture, of what took place. They came from all over southern Great Britain, OK? And they all came into different areas. You have the US on the, uh, let's see, that would be the west side. Uh, and that was run by the US military. You had gold, Juno, and sword. Gold was Britain, Juno was Canadian, sword was Britain and the French, okay? And each had a responsibility to make a move. On the fifth, contrary to what everybody believed, because the waves were still 20 feet high, the forecaster, the weather forecaster, came in and said, there is a window of about two to four hours where you might be able to sneak in a group and get them foothold into Normandy. And because they had 100,000 men on ships already on board and ready to move out, in fact, some of them had already started out on the 5th because that was the invasion date and had to come back, they decided if, if they did not move on the, the 6th of, of June, because of weather, not weather conditions, because of tide conditions, they couldn't do it until like the 18th of June and then in July. And they, f they felt like they just couldn't wait, and he gambled, and the gamble paid off. So at midnight, the 82nd and the 101st Airborne dropped into France. Now that is a military map that I can't read. <laughs> but you can get the feel of it that from all of these places, in Wales and all around the, the coast of Great Britain, Allied forces were engaging into one spot, and that was Normandy right here. Now, Cherbourg was a deep sea port, and the Germans had enormous force surrounding that because they felt that if you were going to have a major invasion, you had to have a deep sea port to unload all the equipment. That's where the Mulberry Bridges came in to destroy that theory. And secondly, well, let me show it on this. I think this is better. Yeah. So here's what we had on the early morning. You got the 82nd going to drop in around St. Mary Glace. OK. And the reason is the Germans were up here. And they needed to protect any kind of movement coming back to protect the invasion of the Utah Beach. OK. The American 101st was designed to get in the same area, and there were a couple roads, major road areas, that they had to block off so they could protect against from this Cotentin Peninsula where the Germans were and through here. They had to give Utah a chance to get on the beach or get on land. Over here, the British 6th Airborne dropped at a place called Pegasus Bridge. And the incredible achievement of that is still, it, it's just remarkable. But they have to protect the canals and the road that goes up to La Harve and goes up to Calais, OK? And they had to protect that for the first 15 hours in order to protect to get all the men and equipment on shore. So the night of the 5th, around 12.15 on the 6th in the morning, the invasion, the, uh, the paratroopers took place. Now, on Pegasus, you had the British 6th. And they, most of them, or all of them, came in on horse gliders. Those are just wooden glider planes. The night of the 5th and 6th, early morning 6th, a lot of cloud overhead. Weather was ugly. And all of the planning that the pilots had before they landed was 
they were able to see the land and see the sites on, on, on the ground to be able to maneuver. They didn't have the equipment that we have today. And so the gliders had to make a decision when to bank, when to turn, when to land, and where would they land? And do you know that two of them landed within 50 feet of the bridge? And, they, and afterwards, uh, heard many times that it was the greatest military feat of a pilot in World War II, of being able to drop in there. And the Brits got out of there, and within 20 minutes, they had protected the bridge. They killed all the Germans, and they had control of that bridge until the next morning when Lord Horvat and his team came up from the beaches of Juneau and, uh, and relieved them. And by the way, Horvat came up. He had a, a white tunic on and a backpack, and he was walked next to by a brigade with a, a bagpiper. And they, the bagpipe was playing all the way from the beach. So he was notifying the Germans, we're here. You want to come get us? Come on. But they were very successful at it. I put a couple pictures in here about uh, they landed near the bridge. This was the last survivor in 2009 of, of the group that uh, flew. 82nd and 101st. St. Mary Glace and St. Mary de, Marie de Bon uh, were to protect the west flank. Initially, it was unsuccessful because the pilots in that area were not as successful as the pilots in the Pegasus area. They didn't know where they were, and they dropped them sometimes 20 miles away from the beach, and they were scattered everywhere. And one of, one of Rommel's plans that he was very successful at was he flooded all of the areas behind the beach. Not all the areas, most of the areas. So a lot of our pilots fell into the water and drowned. Their equipment was not sufficient to get them out of it fast enough. And so that was unsuccessful. The other piece of that was the asparagus spears. He made these long spears that come out of the ground to break any fall of anybody. It was designed to impale them and to create a lot of havoc with the uh, pilot or the uh, parachutes that are coming down. Further deception the night before the actual invasion. They threw par uh, dummy paratroopers into both areas so that when they hit the ground, they popped off like a firecracker, like it was a gunshot, which caused a great deal of concern among the Germans thinking that there were more paratroopers than there really were. They, and they heard them from all different areas, so they, they, the Germans thought they were being surrounded by it. The second thing they did is they created this aluminum flak that they dropped over Calais to demonstrate that there was uh, something going on in Calais, another deception plan. Uh, they created heavy bombardment in Normandy to try and protect the soldiers coming on board, but the bombardments, for the most part, were not very successful, again, because of weather. And uh, the 82nd and 101st dropped off target, caused further confusion. The fact that they were dropped off target and caused confusion, not only to themselves, but to the Germans, because the Germans again thought there was a greater amount of paratroopers because they were all over the place. And they never put it all together to understand that in fact, they, uh, they were just being dropped by a number of people. So here's again a picture of the beaches. You see this little piece right here? That's called Point the Hawk, a major military point on this whole coast because it sticks out and juts out. And more importantly, it sticks out. And if you go to the left, the big guns could cover Utah Beach. If you turn to the right, you could cover Omaha beaches. And what they had up there were six German 155 millimeter cannons situated 100 feet above Omaha and Utah Beach. And so, the Allies decided they had to take that out quickly because they would have had no protection in Omaha or Utah. So the 2nd Ranger Battalion and the 5th marched up and they were decimated by the gunfire that came from on top of the hill, okay, on top of the, the cliffs. And the history was courageous American Rangers silently deadened Nazi shore batter, nearly half of them die. They got up there. There were no cannons, no cannons. Half of those people that were killed there 
were, uh, were fighting a battle that wasn't even necessary. The Germans had moved the cannons back, thinking that that might be too easy a prey for the, uh, for the gunners and for the, uh, uh, for the planes, so they moved them back into some uh, clandestine areas. So the, the Germans removed the cannons, no cannons on po Point de Hoc, but one of the things it did is that once the Allies got on top of the hill and found that there were no cannons, they marched towards Omaha. And they were able to kind of come from behind the beach because Omaha was so well protected by just the topography and by the, the defensive position that Rommel set them up in that this was almost a blessing in disguise because they were able to get relief, they being people on Omaha Beach. By the way, this is George Kirshner, who was one of the US Rangers in the 2nd Battalion. He went back with his family to take a picture. And this was the picture that he had to uh, show them about what they had to do to go up this. this. Pretty significant, eh? Utah Beach, westernmost beach, 4th Infantry, assault on D-Day. 4th Division was taken with relatively few casualties. That particular part of the beach was not protected defensively very well. In fact, uh, Teddy Roosevelt Jr. was the chief of the 4th Infantry. He was the oldest man in D-Day, and he landed two miles from his expected location. So when he reported back to everybody, he says, I'm going ahead with the troops, Roosevelt said. Get word to the Navy and bring them in. We'll start the war from here. <laughs> Omaha, bloody Omaha. The two uh, divisions, the 29th and the 1st, took it head on. The geography, and I've been there three times, the, the geography of the topography, of the way the, the coast is lined up and the hills are lined up, provided a perfect cross-firing cross from both sides. And they were dug deep into the hillsides to where bombs weren't going to get them out. And the big, big guns that they had were so well protected with um, the, 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 uh, the armament around them that they, uh, they just didn't have a chance. And so one of the things that happened was that the idea was to bring the tanks in. 29 tanks were scheduled to go in on Omaha Beach. Um, and the way in which it would to come in was they were dropped off a couple miles out. And they were put in a bag. And the bag was supposed to float. And with the machinery and the, and the, and the thrust of the, uh, the engine was to push them in shore. And once they hit dirt, they would unload or they would, they would take the the cover off, and they would move up on shore. Well, they had practiced that over and over and over, and it worked. It was a genius idea, except they never did it with waves of 20 feet high. And almost every one of those tanks went down with the soldiers. And the, the difficulty with that was the tanks were going to be major heavy armament to get them through the beach and get them up over the hill that you had to climb up on. And the other thing was, it was great protection for the, for the foot soldier to get behind when the tanks are moving forward. So they, the soldiers who landed on Omaha Beach were in a crossfire, and they had no protection. And as one of the Germans said, in the first four hours that he was protected, and he did survive, he was only one of two, he said, I unloaded 10,000 bullets in the first four hours. And he said, I didn't even have to aim. He said, I just had to throw it down on the beach, and I knew I was going to get people. So you had this crossfire effect. The first wave, these are pictures of the first wave, and these are actual pictures by Frank, or Robert Kappa. He was a photographer on Omaha Beach. Kappa was a uh, Hollywood guy who wanted to find out if he could get some good pictures, and a reporter. Uh, uh, on the first wave. Well, he did get them, but uh, he was horrified. So these are some of the pictures of the first wave. This hill here, my son and I walked up this hill afterwards. These are all of his pictures. Now, a little diversion. 
kept talking about all these soldiers, all these guys. Many people don't know that there was a woman who uh, made D-Day, but she was clandestine. She was the estranged wife of Ernie, Ernest Hemingway. They're both writers. And she got on there, and what she did is she was a journalist, and she was a stowaway in the bathroom and then disguised herself as a stretcher bearer and got out there and got some pictures and got the first article in before Ernest Hemingway did. <laughs> so she was pretty proud of that. But most people don't know that a woman did get on D-Day Beach uh, in the initial assault. Here were the deaths on June 4. Uh, and you can see, very simply, about 2,500 in Omaha Beach. And there were some miraculous things that happened on that that I'll talk about in a few minutes. But there was about, and the numbers change a little bit, between 4,400 and 4,700, so you know what kind of number it is of, of fatalities. There were 9,000 um, people that uh, died that day. So when D-Day is over, <coughs> end of June 6, you have the 4th Infantry on the Utah Beach controlling a small section of land. You have the 1st and 29th controlling a small section of land. You have the Gold Juno Sword Area con containing a larger section of land because there was very little in the way of um, a defense against them. It wasn't they didn't have any, but it wasn't as heavy as... as uh, uh, Omaha Beach. But the big thing that wasn't concluded was Khan was not taken on D-Day as expected. Montgomery was supposed to take Khan on D-Day or D-Day plus one. On June 7, this is a picture of the people now leaving the ships to go on shore. Look how easy it was for them now that the initial assault was repelled and uh, they were miles inland. It was just so much easier for them to get on shore. Over the next seven weeks, other important battles took place. Overlord was from June 6th to August 25th. In July, Patton breaks out with the Third Army, and he goes through all of these places. And he is moving forward, but then they had some delays. One of the problems they had was the un- that's the word I want to use, was the surprise of the bocage. And the way the bocage, which is just these little blocks of land that are cut off, were covered with these hedgerows, and you couldn't get through them. And it made for a tremendous defense by the Germans to just sit back and wait till you came through, and then you, you get blasted. So that was a delay that, that caused a lot of problems for the Allies. On D-Day plus one, they built two of these harbors. You can see the harbors. I show this picture down here. You, you, don't, you can't possibly understand what it is, but it's the construction of how this thing is built. And it was built in uh, London on the Thames. And then they brought it over in pieces, and they laid it out. And they built this bridge that was almost two miles long so that the, from the deep sea of the big ships coming in, they could unload the equipment and everything. The other thing on D-Day 1 is Operation Pluto. They did create a gasoline oil line from London to the beaches. In order, you can't fight a war without oil and, and gasoline. But what was so interesting is that only 8% of the fuel delivered to Allied forces in Northwest Europe between D-Day and V-Day was via these pipelines. In other words, it was a game plan that worked, it functioned, but it wasn't working the way in which they thought would be successful. So they had them all come in by either tanker, bulk, or in cans. D-Day plus six, July 12, firm foothold. And you can see here, everything is really reached out down through here and here and here. Well, I got my, sorry, like that. But look at Khan. Khan is still under the control of the Germans. Khan was supposed to be taken on June 6 or 7, the Allies did not control it until July 20. And this, to this day, is one of the controversial, uh, controversial positions of what Montgomery did versus what the Allies felt should have been done. 
And Patton was very, very critical of Montgomery for delay and delay and delay. And in the end, it was, uh, Kahn was decimated. I think the only two things left in Kahn was the church and the, uh, the infirmary or the hospital. Everything else was level. Facts about the Battle of Normandy. D-Day, it's about 150, 175,000 soldiers, 50,000 equipment. D-Day plus one. The pipeline, Mulberry Harbors, uh, July or June 8, 11, those trips came in. And by July 4, 1 million men came and landed in Normandy. The overall fatalities in the Battle of Normandy for that time frame, the 6th of June to August 25th, half a million people. August 25th, liberation of Paris. And that was the marching down the Champs Elysees with Charles de Gaulle. Finally, success. The invasion was successful. And uh, after the Paris liberation, the move was to go into Germany, but they were stifled by the Germans retaliating at the Battle of the Bulge, where they delayed and tried to circumvent two or three of the divisions so that the Allies couldn't use Antwerp as a deep sea port to bring in all of their uh, equipment and gasoline and oil. And <clears throat> The march to Germany was January to May. On May 8, Germany surrenders. Early problems for the Allies. Bombers did not drop bombs on the beach, bad weather. 29 tanks, support troops on Omaha Beach, 27 sank, 56 were planned. 2,000 paratroopers drowned or died before fighting, bad equipment. 18,000 paratroopers dropped in wrong areas, bad weather. Bloody Omaha, more entrenched than expected. The Mulberry Bridge at Omaha was destroyed in severe storms. Con, June 7 to June 20th, or July 20th. Early successes. Hitler was duped, did not respond to his field commanders. Deception plans effective with the dummies, etc. Ultra secret worked, provided information the Allies needed. 15th German Army didn't move until August of 44. Normandy, Germans caught by surprise weather, no leaders, Allied heroes on the beaches. British paratroops achieved early vital objectives. My observations. The deception worked. The spies of Garbo, Brutus, and Tricycle were absolutely essential, particularly Garbo. The bravery of the soldiers, I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Uh, other reasons, the French underground were asked to disrupt land communications and railways. The land communications were important because if they don't have land communications, they have to go to wireless. And every time they hit the wireless, Bletchley Park picked up every one of those signals. So Bletchley knew then what was going on by the Germans who were being disadvantaged. The weather D-Day errors by the German command, Allied e leadership. And one of the things that I think is so important in terms of the German soldiers is that von Rundstedt had a bad strategy Poor leadership from Hitler's control. But it was that centralized command, that, that German belief that there is a leader and a follower. And the follower always follows the leader. And they kept looking for the leader. And yet, with the Americans and other allies, but what I know about the Americans at Utah and particularly Omaha, is that when they were caught, they then went to a creative uh, change of plans with or without orders. And that was the success. The German management style did not work. Many of you have heard of this guy, Stephen Ambrose. And these are just a number of his books. And I have a couple over there for you to look at if you want. But his book on D-Day, he talks about, really, Germany's Atlantic Wall was a failure. This impregnable 1,000-mile a uh, wall was supposed to stop anything that came in. But it really didn't because on four of the five beaches, within two or three hours, they had penetrated and got land. And it wasn't, except for Omaha, that was taken about a half a day or so. So the genius of the plan, the genius of the deception, the genius of the maneuvering and how they created that, created the success of D-Day. These are heroes. Bravery of the Allied soldiers on the beach, especially Omaha. 
You have to understand, they got in on low tide. By high tide, they were being pushed up against the wall, and they couldn't move. And it took people like General Dutch Coda and a couple other people said, if we're going to die on the beach, let's go fight. Go, let's go fight. Let's go try and break through if we can. If we're going to die, let's go die fighting. There were a number of captains out in the, in the frigates who were moving closer and closer to shore to help the guys in Omaha because they knew they were stuck. And some of them moved in against orders. The military, the, the, the naval commander saying, get back, get back. And they were moving in, shooting on the wall to give them some protection. There again, this idea of individuality. Uh, Frazier, 15th Lord Lovett. Can you just picture in your mind, in a battle of war, this man coming with a tunic and a backpack and walking next to this bagpiper, what's walking forward, just coming right into battle. Here I come. I just love that picture. The pilots that, that glided them into uh, uh, Pegasus Bridge. Bridge. Eisenhower and his team for pulling the whole thing together, Turing, breaking of the code, Churchill and his unbelievable involvement with all the details of that thing, the engineers who created engineering techniques to counter the bombs and the, 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 the placement of the, uh, the defensive uh, equipment that was on the beaches, the engineers did an incredible job. And then the spies and the deception plans and then all the others that we don't know about that are out there who were really quite important people in making D-Day a success. Liberation of Europe began uh, at the cemetery. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I keep going, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, at the American cemetery, you have 9,387 US soldiers buried there. 307 are unknown. Three Medal of Honor winners World War II and one Medal of Honor winner World War I are buried there. I'd like to read that, what's up there, you can't read it. If ever proof were needed that we fought for a cause and not for a conquest, it could be found in these cemeteries. Here was our only conquest. All we asked was enough soil in which to bury our gallant dead. I always like to tell my students that uh, if you go back in our history, Americans don't fight for land or anything. They fight to free people. And that's what they did here. Remembrance and tributes so that we don't forget. We are really uh, fortunate tonight to have John Lind. John is director of the Arsenal of Democracy Museum. He's been a Marine, an Air Force member, a Navy military guy for 28 years. He's a master parachutist, and he's going to be jumping this June 5 and 6. I want to introduce you to him, and I want him to make some comments about what he's going to do. Please. Uh, some of you know my more famous cousin, Christine, who runs the library, so. <laughs> uh, I am her lesser known cousin, John. Uh, I went into the Marine Corps in 1980, and um, I've served all three, I've served three branches, and I've been a contract worker for the um, Army, so basically you could probably count all four. Uh, I'm also the engineering officer. I'm the director of the Arsenal Democracy Museum here in Warren, Michigan. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we were given the go-ahead by the city to go ahead and start building buildings over at Veterans Memorial Park. Thank God. Because we've been waiting for a year and a half to get the approval. I'm also the engineering officer for the World War II Airborne Demonstration Team out of Frederick, Oklahoma. They have two C-47s, a double-sized World War II hangar, and uh, one of the largest uh, unrestricted airspaces in the uh, southwest United States. So for the last three years, we've basically been practicing uh, for Normandy. In one way or another, we've been practicing. We've practiced with one ship. We've done dual ship formations. We've done up to five ship formations. 
uh, all for the great event. It's called DAX uh, over Normandy. DAX is what the British call the C-47. We call it the C-47. The British always have names for things, and we always give them an acronym or a military designation. So how do you go back on this thing? I'm just going to play with this for a second because you had some great maps in there. Ah, look at that, huh? Now, I have been a, I'm a life member of the 101st, Air, uh, and um, I've met George Kazimaki many times, and uh, Don Burkett, who's wrote some of the great books about the 101st in the, uh, in the Normandy invasion. If you ever get a chance, go out and pick up their books. Uh, the professor had some very good, maybe I missed the one I wanted, but I, I had a great, there was a great slide in here. Yeah, I'm still, fine. oh, there we go. Okay, so you see the invasion landings uh, of uh, Normandy. Uh, the Dax over Normandy program is, uh, I'll give you a quick clip, uh, clip notes what we're going to do. Uh, we're flying out on June 1st. We are going to uh, arrive in Charles de Gaulle Airport, Paris. We're going to pick up our parachutes, which was sent to the American Embassy. This is how involved the government has gotten into this. Uh, it is a sense of national pride. The Queen will be uh, on, uh, we will be jumping at Duxford, which is the home of the Imperial War Museum. Uh, it is like their Smithsonian, uh, their, their greatest museum. If you ever seen the movie The Battle of Britain, it was filmed at Duxford. So we will arrive at Duxford on the night of the 2nd, June 2nd, uh, we'll try to get a couple hours sleep. June 3rd, we have in processing. Uh, I am ju actually uh, jump mastering. Uh, I have 163 round canopy jumps. I, don't, uh, I do not include my uh, skydives. Uh, I have jump mastered over 80 times. Uh, I also load master the aircraft, and now I'm learning how to sit in the right seat and fly the aircraft, So, uh, which literally takes hours and hours. Um, I'll probably have 70-plus hours before they'll turn, you know, let me go and just say, okay, go ahead and take off the airplane. You know, that's fine. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Um, anyways, the jump master runs the back of the aircraft. He is, or she, is totally responsible for the uh, uh, paratroopers coming out of the back. Uh, there is a whole procedure we go through. It's uh, quite interesting the way it happens. Uh, we hook up. Uh, first command is six minutes. That is a non-ceremonial uh, command. It doesn't necessarily mean we have six minutes, but it's like an attention grabber. Six minutes, get ready. Of course, I'm yelling this through the aircraft, the very noisy aircraft. I don't know how many people have ever ridden in a, uh, a road in a uh, propeller-driven airplane, probably a handful of you. Not many. Everything now is jet, and it's all sealed, and you can actually talk to people. In these aircraft, they smell. They smell like... Um, uh, gasoline or, you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, cordite, uh, av gas, uh, oils, grease, um, but they're alive. They're a living machine. It's, it's the difference between getting on a train and then getting on a steam locomotive. You actually feel, you know, the power of the engine. And the, it's not like a jet. We have to go out, we have to taxi out, and then they have to go through the processes of, of doing run-ups where they got to run cer uh, certain uh, RPMs. And uh, when they get to the one where they'll, they'll run maybe 2,500 RPMs for about 30 seconds, and then the engines are good to go. And then if I'm the jump master, I'll be standing there and I'll, I'll yell out, we're going to haul the mail. And they know that we're leaving. Now, this is it. I mean, th this, is, this is totally it. So um, we take off. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, on June 4th, we will jump for the Queen. She will be there. Uh, this is going to be done at Duxford. It is the first round parachute canopy drop in over 35 years because England has banned round uh, parachutes. For what reason, I have no idea. But anyways, you can still jump round in the, everywhere in Europe and the United States. And, of course, President Trump is going to be there, and they're going to witness this. And I know what, you know, a lot of people, okay, you don't like Trump, that's fine, God bless you. A lot of people do like Trump, but Trump is going to seize on that moment. 
Can you imagine the political capital of him walking through 230 paratroopers wishing them good luck as they make the, you know, the 75th anniversary jump into Normandy? That is a photo op to die for, okay? So we're gonna, on the fourth, we're gonna jump, and then on the fifth, we're on standby for the entire day. We are slated to go at, uh, to uh, leave, uh, get on the aircraft by uh, 1500, which is three o'clock for you civilians, and then we will uh, fly across. And w what happens is we are going to take off from Duxford. We will cross uh, over England. Uh, we will cross the last um, uh, checkpoint we will run into is Maidenstone and then we'll cross the English Channel. We will not be wearing uh, any type of life preservers because there will be search and rescue boats all the way. The aircraft involved, 40 plus, 230 paratroopers. Uh, the British first para will go in in front of us in modern aircraft. Uh, they will, we will uh, cross over the coast uh, from La Havre and then we will hit the famous British uh, eighth para drop zone at Sanderville. Now, the reason you say, why aren't we hitting an American drop zone is because the, the English government has basically uh, helped uh, give the Dax Over Normandy program a gigantic boost by use of the uh, Imperial War Museum. And it's, it, it comes down to the point where uh, they got their skin in the game, so we have to abide by their rules. So we will hit, and, and Sander, I've seen Sanderville. I've seen it from the air. It's a great drop zone, it's wide open. And uh, for the uh, British 8th Para uh, on D-Day was an excellent drop zone to, to land into. So once we land there, it'll be the 5th. There will be up to 100,000 people on the drop zone to see this. Uh, it is the first time that 40 plus uh, C-47s have gotten together for such a drop. Uh, I am the jump master. So I will be in the door all the way crossing the channel. If you're lucky to be on my, uh, on my uh, ship, I'm actually gonna pick somebody up one at a time, have them come over, hook up, because we run static lines. You hook up and I'll have you come over by the door and I'll, I'll block the door so you don't fall out of the plane, because if you fall out of the plane, I'm fired. And uh, I'll let you take some photos. So, and we will cheat. I mean, we'll look like a hundred bucks or a million bucks um, but all of us will be wearing GoPros, and you'll. And the thing is, you will not notice when we're on the ground uh, the GoPros because we will wear bandages over the top of the GoPros. So I'm going to have a. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There are chase planes. It's insanity. There's an. It's just insanity. It's. I mean, the the Discovery Channel's flying with us. So, uh, yeah, they'll be, uh, I don't know what aircraft they're going to go into. It is so important. I can't emphasize the importance of this event is they resurrected, they found the lead C-47 about 10 years ago, and it's called That's All Brother. That was the aircraft that dropped the very first paratroopers uh, just south of St. Mary Glees. They found the aircraft, spent $3.8 million, restored it, and it is jumping again. The, it'll be the lead aircraft coming out of Duxford. Tech, and uh, technically, Peter Braun, who is the head of DAX, he, he is just like me, he's a master, uh, he's a jump master, master parachutist, and he will be jump mastering the lead aircraft because, frankly, he deserves it. I mean, he's put his sweat equity into this. Into this. What team, there are seven different teams uh, four teams from the United States, three, uh, three teams from Europe. And uh, I know what team's supposed to be on the aircraft, but I'm not allowed to say. And I'll tell you privately, but I'll, it's, it's not fair for us to say now. Uh, what aircraft I get onto, who knows? It's like draft hockey. You play where you play. So, and I'm not really worried. As long as I'm running the aircraft, I mean, that's, and here's another deal. You... For three years, we've practiced. This is kind of like NASA going to the moon. You know, they practice. There's redundancy. There's other crews and everything. If you get on your aircraft and your aircraft breaks down for some reason, you're not going. That's just how it goes. I mean, your aircraft will sit, and uh, the other aircraft will take off. So it's like, you know, 
Now, I could say a couple of words, but this is a nice audience. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of words saying if that airplane don't work, so um, especially all the time and effort we put into it. So that's how we're actually remembering uh, D-Day. Uh, it is a gigantic, if you've ever been to uh, Normandy, uh, they actually love the Americans. You don't have to speak French uh, there. It, I speak a little French to get around, but uh, they actually just adore. And we will not be able to buy a drink in St. Mary Glees uh, for the entire uh, duration because everything, everything to the Americans is free. So uh, we'll see. What, after the 6th? We will make two more jumps. We will jump onto the, uh, uh, onto the beaches. We'll do another jump from uh, La Say, France. That's where we're going to be. We're at, we've actually rented a 600-year-old chateau. There's over, uh, almost 100 of us in our group. And we will go to La Say, France, pick up our C-47s. We'll make a jump into France. And then La Say has a major air show on the, on the 9th and 10th. And so we will uh, make an air show drop uh, on the 9th uh, at the uh, Lasse Air Show. So it is a big deal. I mean, the World War II generation is uh, basically they're here now, and then they may not be here later. Um, I jumped on the 70, I jumped uh, the 72nd for Market Garden. Uh, as uh, I'm a member of the UK Pathfinders, and so we did uh, uh, the Market Garden jump. Uh, I did Rackham and Drill, and those are the Rackham is the English drop zone, and Drill is the Polish drop zone. So, uh, the one thing to remember about the paratroopers when this idea was first came up, uh, they were not going to use paratroopers. Uh, they had lost a, a great number of 82nd Airborne paratroopers in the Battle of Husky, which was uh, the Battle of Sicily, uh, because they, a lot of them were shot down by their own. Uh, they were mistaken uh, for German planes. Communication was terrible, and they had a lot of misdrops. And a lot of them drowned. They were dropped right into the ocean. Um, it wasn't until November 1943 when the 11th Airborne famously went out to the Pacific and did some of the most uh, courageous jumps uh, of, in airborne history. They jumped in Corregidor. They jumped in the Philippines. They actually secured one of the prisoner war camps just before the prisoners were going to be executed. The 11th Airborne did that. Uh, Sixth Ranger bat uh, Battalion took on another one of the, of the prisoner war camps. So 11th Airborne proved that the Airborne uh, mission was uh, valid, is available, and ready to go. And America is one of the few countries that actually has a very uh, active uh, airborne mission. They can put uh, people on, men and equipment, sorry, men, women and, and equipment on target very quickly. So if you want to get troops on a target fast, you, uh, you leave it to the airborne, so. But that's the deal and I appreciate you uh, taking, for your kind attention. Yes, ma'am. No, B-24s are bombers, so yeah, that's a good question. There are C-47s, C-49s, and C-53s. Uh, basically, they're the same thing. Uh, C-47s were designed for the military. 49s uh, through 53s were actually converted DC-3s. So there will be 20 people, uh, in 20 paratroopers on the aircraft, plus one jump master, plus one load master. And um, we're going to do two passes. We have practiced forever to do uh, a large stick of 20, and uh, we're not going to do it now. They're going to do two passes because what they're going to do is just what they do is what's called rodeo, and they're going to come right on down, drop 10, circle around, get back into the pattern, and drop 10, uh, and maybe the jump master. So, And if you are that last guy in the stick who's famously called the pusher, you there's... Real, real quick, this is how they do it. If you had like 10 people, right, uh, the doorman is a good pair, is a very good jumper, okay? And it's a, it's a place of honor to get the door spot, okay? It's like, wow, you, you know, you did a good book report for this week, you get the door spot. Um, the people in the middle are basically the less experienced jumpers so that they, actually, when they exit the aircraft, they're, they're going to be right on target. All I have to do is turn into the wind and they're going to go right into the target. They are steerable canopies, 
uh, but they're limiting steril steril canopies. These aren't ram canopies like a skydiver would have. And then the guy in the back, which I'm famously known as the pusher. Uh, if I'm not jump mastering, I'm the pusher. Uh, because uh, what happens is uh, you line up, and there are people on that line say, uh, I don't want to go. You know, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I had second thoughts. You know, and, and um, you get, I love going with students. So I don't really don't go with students because I can't stand them because they make all kinds of stupid mistakes. But sometimes you, no, they do. I mean, it's like they, you know, they, they wig out and stuff. And, uh, and you get on the aircraft, and they're like, they'll call you over, and you know, you go over. Yeah, what, what do you need? And they're like, I'm scared. I'm like, well, so am I, you know. <laughs> and they're like, are you really that scared? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm scared to death, you know. Uh, sometimes, you know, the first jump, in a, I haven't jumped in a, like a month and a half now. So your first one, you're like, you think to yourself, what the hell am I doing? Am I stupid? <laughs> you know, I, got, I have a house. You know, I got people who love me. I must be a moron. And, uh, but uh, the pusher is famous because what happens is they put somebody like me that's kind of strong, and, and he, you're, once you're hooked up, guess what? There's, there's no, you're going to go. You're, you're, you're going to like it or not. I mean, you're, and a lot of times you're not going to like it the way it happens. So uh, that's the way it happens. But so, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, they're going to have, on June 6th, after they watch us jump on the 4th, President Trump is, is uh, meeting the Queen on the 3rd. They're going to they're watch the jump on the 4th, and on, they're going to have a big, a big uh, get-together on the 6th. And that's all, of course, another to die for photo op where all the Allied leaders get together, and they're going to they're gonna go to the beach. Because this is it for the World War II generation, a uh, very... Very few of them will ever make 80 and the 80th anniversary, and then they won't travel. You know, exactly. I mean, you wouldn't travel. No, no, but for in five more years, would you travel? No, 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 no. Exactly, exactly. Probably fly better than I can. So, any more questions? Very good. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, John. Pretty, pretty amazing what's going to take place to remember. Yes. Yeah. Because they had, they had allied uh, people that stayed with them 24/7. Okay. Yeah, they were they were uh, uh, silent partners with them, and stayed with them all the way. But this section of the presentation talks about remembrance and tributes. And what you heard from John, I think, tells you how much my allies were committed, and all of the allies. And when you think about D-Day, about 15,000 young men dropped into this war zone. And June 6th of this year, we will celebrate the 75th anniversary. And what we do is we celebrate their gifts to all of us. Here's a cemetery at Colville Sumer. You can see it overlooking the beach. This is a funny picture. It's not a very clear picture, but it's a, a picture of the, the French put up there. And I wanted you to see the coastline as you, you go down the beach. I want to tell you a story about my son and I when we visited there. Uh, we went to this hotel called Hotel Churchill, which is right in the town of Bayou that was liberated by the Americans. And the French don't forget, what you heard from John today is absolutely true. Allies cannot buy a drink in Normandy. They're absolutely adored, and mainly because The lady that I met with was a lady who worked behind the, the counter. And along the walls, the wooden walls in this little hotel, were pictures of Allied soldiers during the um, emergence or, or the, uh, the clearing or uh, the liberation of Bayou. And there were pictures of soldiers with kids and wine tasting and all of that. And I said to her, I said, do you know if 
if the families of these kids and the soldiers ever got together, oh, we have hundreds of stories like that. And whenever any American soldiers come back here, we always celebrate. And when I say celebrate, they celebrate at the kindergarten level, at the primary school level, at the middle and senior high school levels, where those kids have to meet those allied soldiers. And they have to do artist work. They have to talk to them. Because the Normans don't quite understand how else to thank the Americans for being liberated after four years. So I'm talking to this lady, and she's telling me all these stories. And then I said, well, was your mother part of this? And then she said, yes. And she started tearing up. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to embarrass you or anything. I said, what? Well, these are not tears of. My mother kept saying we were four years plus with the Germans. We knew someday that we were going to get liberated. We thought it probably would be the Brits. But the Allied American soldiers came in and liberated, and we fell in love with the Allied Americans. And she said that her mother kept telling her over and over all through the years before she died, I don't understand Americans. I don't understand why the mothers of all those young men were allowed to come over and free us. That is the value system of our country, isn't it? And for her to recognize that, and for the Normans to believe in that, and they do. John is absolutely right. They do believe that. That was a story that my son and I experienced. Where's Mike? Can I say one last one? Sure. If, um, you know, I've been doing this for like 30 years in and out of the military. I got a chance to, and Don Burkett was a really good friend of mine, and uh, he wrote many books about the 101st. And he was telling me a story. Uh, we were sitting there, and he, one of the most iconic photos, you know, the Marines raising the flag on Sarabachi, and, you know, you go through all these iconic photos of World War II. There's an iconic photo of paratroopers holding a Nazi flag when they liberated St. Mary Glees, right? So Don Burkett is there because the 82nd, 101st, as soon as they started taking flak, he goes, man, they were just throwing people out of aircraft. Aircraft were on fire. People were on fire, falling through the air. And he's like, it was a nightmare. I was just happy to get out of the damn plane alive. And um, so Don's standing there, and they're like, they're like this, and they got the flag out, and they're, you know, they're holding the flag, and Don's like this. And uh, here comes the famous photographer, Robert Kappa, and he's like, guys, I want to get that picture. And Don's like, yeah, I want to get the picture, too. And he gets out of the photo. <laughs> and he's like, like, you know, thinking like a couple minutes later, he goes, what the hell did I do? I just got out. What was that? And then a week later, he gets a letter from home. Yeah, I saw this picture from where you're at. And he's like, yeah, I should have been in that damn photo. <laughs> it is true. I want to tell you a story that maybe some of you have heard. But if you haven't, I think you'll enjoy this story. Sixty-eight years ago today, General Dwight Eisenhower gave the final order for the Allied invasion of Normandy. It was the eve of D-Day. Among the Americans who fought to liberate Europe in the months ahead was First Lieutenant Billy Harris. And that brings us to Steve Hartman's On the Road, part mystery, part love story. Peggy Harris of Vernon, Texas, never got a knock at the door, never got a telegram, never got anything definitive explaining what happened to her husband, Billy, during World War II. And so, in the absence of answers, she has remained dutiful to this day. Billy was married to me all of his life, and I choose to be married to him all of my life. Peggy and Billy got married just six weeks before he got shipped off to war. A fighter pilot, his last mission was July 17, 1944, over Nazi-occupied northern France. Billy never returned from that mission. At first, he was reported as missing. Then he was reported as alive and coming home. Then Peggy got a letter saying he'd actually been killed and was buried in one cemetery. Then another letter saying he was buried in a different cemetery. Then she was told maybe those aren't his remains at all. For Peggy, it was very frustrating. And so I waited longer 
months, turned to years. And still no answer. Turned to decades. So I wrote to my congressman. Wrote repeatedly, asking for any information about the fate of her husband. The last letter, in 2005, was directed to Representative Mac Thornberry of Texas, who also happens to be vice chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. In his reply, Thornberry said Billy was still listed as missing in action in the National Archives. Didn't feel it was right that he just went off to war and didn't come back. End of story. Billy's cousin, Alton Harvey, grew up with this mystery. You need to know what had happened to him. So, a few years ago, he decided to try and get to the bottom of it for Peggy. He started by requesting Billy's military records. And that's all it took. I said, that can't be. It never dawned on me he was there. Few missing soldiers have ever been easier to find than Billy Harris. Here in Normandy, France, at the world's most famous cemetery, along its most well-traveled path, the answer has been lying all along, clear and sobering as a white marble cross. So why then, as late as 2005, was Peggy's congressman still telling her that her husband was missing in action? Turns out, there are no records of Representative Thornberry ever even checking with the National Archives. And if he had, as we did, he would have seen, it says right there, KIA, killed in action. Thornberry didn't want to talk to us. And for her part, who knows? Peggy harbors no grudge. You have to learn to be forgiving. Mm. She's just glad to finally have an answer. Since learning her husband was buried here, Peggy has been sending flowers. Valentine's Day. Ten times a year she sends flowers. His birthday. Making this, by all accounts. Wedding anniversary. The most decorated grave in all of Normandy. Christmas. Cemetery officials say she's also, as far as they know, the last widow who still visits here. After 60 years, she's clearly got a lot of mourning to make up for. When people speak of closure, they are people who haven't experienced anything like this. Acceptance. Peggy says at this point, that's the best she can hope for. And these visits help her get there. Yeah. Plus, she says, after just six weeks together as husband and wife, and more than six decades apart, any time together, is a treasure. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Normandy, France. Peggy has discovered that the people of one French town have loved and honored her husband almost as long as she has. Tomorrow, on the anniversary of D-Day, Steve will take us there. That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world, good night. On this anniversary of D-Day, we continue our story of one of the American soldiers who fought to liberate France from the Nazis, First Lieutenant Billy Harris. As we told you last night, it took his widow six decades of battling bureaucracy to learn his fate, but it turns out that his death was just the beginning of an amazing tale. Here again is Steve Hartman with On the Road in Normandy, France. It's now been 67 years since the liberation of France, but at today's D-Day ceremony in Normandy, there was one woman who's still in mourning. In fact, until recently, Peggy Harris of Vernon, Texas, didn't even know her husband Billy was buried here, and certainly didn't know the story I'm about to tell you. Billy was a fighter pilot, shot down and killed in July of 44 over Nazi-occupied Northern France. But because of a series of snafus, miscues, and miscommunications, that information never got to his wife. As far as she knew, Billy was just missing. How many years did you wait? All my life. Peggy never remarried, never moved on, and might never have known the whole story if a relative hadn't looked into his military records a few years ago. The surprise wasn't that he died. Peggy had come to assume that. It was what came after. Here in the tiny Normandy town of Levant, the main road is actually called Place Billy D. Harris. It's the same road the townspeople have been marching down three times a year for the past 60 years, in part to commemorate his sacrifice. How much does Billy mean to them? 
Just listen to the mayor's voice when she gets to reading his name on the monument. That's how much. Hello, Peggy. And by extension, that admiration now goes to his wife. So happy to see you again. <laughs> Since learning her husband crashed near here, Peggy has been making an annual pilgrimage. She visits the nearby woods where the plane went down, escorted by 91-year-old Guy Serlo, the only witness still living. Guy said Billy was able to maintain control of the plane despite his condition and avoid the village. A hero in death. At first, they buried Billy in their local cemetery, covering his grave with flowers knee-deep. Even after his body was moved to the American cemetery at Normandy, the town continued to take flowers to his grave. How can I not be grateful and hold these people very dear? The people of Levant say they just wish they could have done more. If only I was able to help, Guy said, to which Peggy responded, you did. I like to think that he was still conscious enough to know that a friend stood by. <laughs> and that this man was that friend. <laughs> Her gratitude is matched only by theirs. In Levant, the American sacrifice is still very much treasured and honored. So we, we don't forget. They don't forget. And now that we know the story. They don't forget. Neither will we. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road in <laughs> Levant, France. They still and don't that forget. that is the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world, good night. September 2013, we're almost through. September 2013, two Brits, two British artists, decided to do something special on the beaches of Normandy. And what they did is they went there and they had additional about 60 volunteers who were gonna help them create this artistic design on the beach. When people heard about it, 500 other people came forward to help them. And basically it was to create an image of 9,000 soldiers fallen on the beaches of Normandy. And you could see how they used the patterns and you can see what it looked like. And you have to remember they did this at low tide because the high tide is gonna wash it away. So there were 500 people who came in not to forget what these people had done during that period of time. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. Look at it from the beach level. They didn't forget, nor do we forget. <laughs>